Okay, so um, I need to move on a little bit now, and I want to talk about um, the, in fact, the earlier way that nature developed to make um, energy uh, using proton gradients, and this part actually preceded the development of respiration, as you'll see. It's what I somewhat flippantly referred to as photosynthesis release one in my first lecture when I was giving you a, a, a sketch of, of evolution. Who knows? I mean, these are very rough numbers, but me have evolved about 3.4 billion years ago when life, early life had begun to exhaust this sea of chemicals that had been produced. And it's uh, known as cyclic uh, photophosphorylation. And it's a way of taking the energy in sunlight and making, making ATP. So whatever organism figured this out, this was a really big deal. Because now instead of having to use the sort of natural reserves, like the way the food around was depleting resource, just like our petroleum reserves, this was able to take the abundantly available sunlight and use it to make uh, energy. So uh, the, the that's the principle. It uses the energy in sunlight. And it, the way it does it is it uses the, the sunlight to establish a proton gradient, just as we've been discussing earlier, and then uses that to make ATP. And the, there's a special molecule that's involved in um, absorbing the, the energy from the sunlight. You've all heard it, I'm sure, chlorophyll. There are a couple of, of um, two major variants of this uh, molecule. Here's one of them, chlorophyll A. And you don't have to memorize the structure. But note, I want you to notice a couple of things. One is uh, there's a metal in the middle, a magnesium. And then there are, it's uh, coordinated with these, um, uh, with these, uh, the cyclic ring system. And notice all the conjugated double bonds. So this uh, chlorophyll is tuned to absorb energy from the, the visible range of, of sunlight. And when it absorbs a photon of energy, it kicks an electron up to a uh, higher orbital. And if the electron's in a higher orbital, it's more easily lost. And this is, has a consequence. So uh, the way this, this system works is you have a molecule of chlorophyll. That's what I'm uh, abbreviating here. Oh, uh, let me tell you something else, too. It's not just, it's more sophisticated than this. There are, so this is the molecule that absorbs a wavelength, a particular wavelength from sunlight. But this is embedded in a, a, a multi-protein structure that has a bunch of other uh, molecules that absorb at different wavelengths and then funnel that energy down to the one that chlorophyll came comes in. So in fact, the whole thing is like a big antenna that's able to absorb quite a bit of energy from different wavelengths in sunlight and get it down to the chlorophyll. When the chlorophyll uh, absorbs energy, it goes up to an excited state and as I said, now the electron's in a higher orbital, it's lost more easily. So this has become a better reducing agent. It's able to give its electrons to things that it couldn't do down in this energy state. So we come down one of these thermodynamic hills that you're st hopefully starting to get used to, where it comes down in little hops to an a carrier that has this en level of energy, down, free energy, down. And similarly to the principle that we talked about in um, respiration, a proton is pumped from what I'm going to say, uh, in this case, I'll show you what I mean, but I'll say from a, a proton that's out to a proton that's in. And by doing that, it establishes a proton gradient 
and that gives rise to ATP. At the end of the day, we have a chlorophyll, at the end of this cycle, we have this chlorophyll minus the electrons. These kind of flow back. That's why it's called cyclic photophosphorylation. The electrons go through these carriers, and then they return to, to chlorophyll. So wonderful system. Uh, there are, are still uh, back, oops, it is still back, oops, I seem to have accidentally advanced this, okay. There's still uh, bacteria around that, uh, that run this system. So if you remember, we talked about um, biosynthesis, the, the need for energy. Well, here you are, we've got ATP. But there's something else hopefully you now appreciate, and that is that um, ATP is not enough to take carbon dioxide and make it into sugars or carbon compounds. We need a source of reducing power as well, because remember, carbon dioxide is the most oxidized form of carbon. So uh, these early organisms solved it by getting, re making reducing power from another source. Many of them used hydrogen sulfide as a source, and they used NADP+. Plus. Now, it, this is a, a minor variation of NADH. It's got one more phosphate on it. You can look it up in your book. Um, this variant of uh, NAD is used for preferentially for biosynthetic purposes, but everything I've told you about any NAD in terms of sh uh, banking electrons applies here. So um, the electrons from here are uh, grabbed. The cell makes NADPH, which it can use as reducing power for biosynthesis. You get elemental sulfur and a hydrogen ion. So this process, uh, an organism that used this kind of uh, uh, photophosphorylation to make ATP would get its reducing power through a process something like this, and then it could make sugars, and then from that point on, they can be used to make all the other molecules that, that you need. The key thing is to get from the carbon dioxide down into a more reduced form of, of carbon. So, that works pretty well. However, a better system came up, evolved in evolution. This was the one I, again, somewhat flippantly called uh, photosynthesis release two when I was, when I was talking. Uh, this is known as, probably came up who knows again, but maybe three billion years ago, and it's known as non-cyclic photophosphorylation. And what's important um, about this system and why it's an improvement over the other is using the, it uses the energy in the sunlight to make ATP, just as we've learned, but it also uses the energy in sunlight to make AD, NADPH. So in other words, this second version gives the cell, simply from the energy in sunlight, everything it needs to take carbon dioxide and make it into organic uh, compounds. And it's, it's a pretty cool system. Evolutionarily, it's built on the older one, the first arising one. You'll still see the elements of it present, but with a new variation added in. So it's very much the way we do design when you're doing engineering. You get something that's working and then you can use that as a basis to move to a new and improved version. And if you get a new improved version and you get a little advantage over your neighbors, natural selection makes sure that that better system gets, uh, gets uh, <coughs> established. So here's, here's how this non-cyclic photophosphorylation starts. We take a chlorophyll and it absorbs a quantum of, of energy, and it kicks itself up to an excited state of chlorophyll as before. It, electrons come down, energetically downhill, and remember that theme, I keep saying that the, you know, it's a, these thermodynamic properties, as we think about free energy, it doesn't matter what path you take, whether you come shooting right down or you come down 
through it, uh, you get the same energy back. What's amazing about the system, if it didn't have all this e extra apparatus, you'd kick up the electron and then it would just come right back and you get a little radio, little energy given off, you would have accomplished anything. And what's terrific about this photo phosphorylation system, it's able to capture the energy that's in that excited chlorophyll. So at this point, uh, and as it's coming down, as I said, we have H plus going from H plus to H plus in. I'll tell you, give you a picture of what I mean by that in a minute, but there, there we're getting ATP uh, made. So this time, the difference is, instead of the electrons going back to that chlorophyll, it was missing its electrons. The electrons instead go to a chlorophyll, which is at a somewhat higher energy level than the first one, and it has absorbed, just absorbed quantum energy, and it's kicked itself up to an even more excited state. And these electrons from this system come on and fill up this uh, chlorophyll. So this one over here is called photosystem two. And the term used in the field to describe what I'm about to tell you here is now called photosystem one. Okay, so what we have now uh, from this system is a, an excited molecule of chlorophyll that's even more excited than we were before. In fact, and so it's even more able to give off its electrons. It has more reducing power. In fact, it is enough reducing power that it can reduce any DP. So um, NADP plus electrons coming downhill, you get NADPH. So here we are, reducing power made by using the energy in sunlight, ATP made using the energy in, in sunlight. So by just using this non-cyclic uh, photophosphorylation system, the cell's got what it needs to take carbon dioxide and put it through a sequence of reactions that will let it make sugars and other things. In this course, I don't have enough time to go through the biosynthetic synthetic pathway. Uh, it's in your textbooks. You might find it interesting to look at. We're not making a big issue of it in there, but it exists, and you can see that it obviously exists. So there's one more wrinkle here, which might be sort of eerily reminiscent of when I, the issue I posed for you when I asked about whether we could just keep on doing glycolysis. I can't just let the system run. I forgot about something so far. <laughs> Over here. This guy lost an electron. <laughs> you can't get it back because the, the electrons went over there. They have to come from somewhere. Well, the energetics of the system now are such that it can get electrons from, from water. And what's left over when you take the electrons from water? We have half of an oxygen molecule. Here's the cost, it's either, uh, it's a, a waste product, if you will, from this very efficient uh, non-cyclic photophosphorylation system, but it's molecular oxygen. And it was when this system developed that we started to have oxygen appear on the, on, uh, in, this, in this world. The, um, or the organelle that carries out uh, photosynthesis uh, actually, well, the first organisms that learned how to do this are called cyanobacteria. They're, they're sometimes sort of rather incorrectly called blue-green algae because they are, um, they are bacteria, but you see cyanobacteria all the time. And similarly to what happened with the mitochondria, there's now abundant evidence that uh, the way photosynthesis happens in plants is a cyanobacterium got trapped somehow inside an early plant cell and is now a permanent part of the uh, plant cell and it's called a chloroplast. So it's derived from a bacterium 
you see um, the you know plants are green if you could look in and see the the uh, chloroplasts inside this shows um, the chloroplasts coming in. And here's their basic structure. They too have a double membrane. They have an outer membrane. They have an inner membrane. They have a part that's called the stroma. And that's essentially like the cytoplasm of a, of a normal cell. And they have something in here called a lumen. It's a space. And the membrane that binds it is a special membrane called a thylakoid membrane. And that gradient is established by pumping an electron from the stroma, which I'll call, I called out, into the lumen, which I called in. Again, the point is the cell managed to establish a proton gradient, and it's able to make uh, the chloroplast is able to establish a proton gradient and make um, and make ATP. And there's a um, transmission <laughs> micrograph of a chloroplast. You can see the thylakoid membranes uh, inside. It's not too hard to imagine that that was, in fact, a cyanobacterium that got in there. And there's, there's quite a bit of additional evidence that supports that. <laughs>